have well over 100 people here today, um, so I think we'll get started. So what are we going to be covering today? Um, uh, the uh, extraordinary noise around legislation and the importance of legislation, of course, um, I think is uh, unavoidable at the moment. It is uh, as confusing as it has ever been. It's been as exciting as it's ever been if you've been in this space for a long time. Uh, and it is a real confusing acronym fest. Uh, hopefully in this session today, we'll dive into what some of these, these letters mean uh, and we'll get to the bottom of it. But one of the most important things we like to do at the Stanford Procurement Pledge is translate things for procurement. So I'm joined by a phenomenal group of people today that hopefully uh, can help us go through and, and digest some of these uh, legislations, what it means for them uh, as well. Now, I appreciate many of you might be joining an SPP meeting uh, for the first time. So we are going to go into a bit of uh, a very short overview of what the SPP actually is, what on earth this is all about. Uh, you're going to meet some of the team uh, and we'll give you a bit of an update. Uh, and we're even starting planning on the summer solstice today, the longest day of the year, we're planning for the spring equinox in March 21st, 2024, which for those that know is the epic World Sustained Procurement Day where we uh, basically go live for 24 hours of non-stop content about sustainable procurement, which is uh, a wonderful labor of love. So hopefully you're all looking forward um, to that. But today it's all about legislation landscape, making sense of it. And we have a fantastic audience with us. So more from them uh, in a second. So for those that don't know the SPP, uh, Stone Procurement Pledge was formed uh, over four years ago now uh, by two CPOs who felt that procurement could and should be doing more on sustainability. And the procurement can own sustainability alongside everybody else, not have it self-dictated to uh, by others. So we are procurement. We are for procurement by procurement. We're not run by consultants. We're not run by anyone else with an agenda. We are run by procurement professionals completely. Sustainability is our responsibility. We commit to that. And we also, of course, not only commit to building a better future for people and planet, but dare I say a better future for our profession uh, as well. We think that's just as important. So obviously, we have a grand vision of all procurement practices having sustainability embedded to them by 2030. And to do that, we think a remarkable 1 million procurement professionals could do that. So we want to get a 1 million procurement professionals uh, that will be one big Zoom meeting uh, in 2030 uh, to commit to the Sustainable Procurement Pledge. And more importantly, we want evidence uh, that we've helped change the decision making of as many of those million procurement professionals uh, as possible. And we think we will do that by empowering and equipping procurement professionals at every level of the organization with the content, the tools, the knowledge, just the translation and the navigation of all the stuff that's out there. Um, but also by encouraging and enabling uh, uh, leadership to allow you to take chances, to, to try things, to develop things, uh, and to make it happen. So hopefully that gives you a guide of what we're trying to do. We've grown extraordinarily in the last uh, few years. Uh, we're now over 12,000 procurement professionals globally who've signed the pledge. You can sign the pledge by going to spp.earth, or you can join our LinkedIn group, our private LinkedIn group. So either way works until we get our, ourselves sorted with a new platform, which is uh, are going to be coming very soon as well. We're in every country you can imagine. I'm sure you can see from the chat where people are saying hello. Uh, it's people from all over the world. And we're already tracking that nearly three quarters of you have already said somehow that we've been able to positively influence your decision making and change the way that you work and so on, which is extraordinarily exciting, even though uh, we're still so young. So huge thanks for all of you uh, for taking part. Just a quick uh, overview of how we're structured. Um, so to help the leadership, the procurement leaders, the CPOs, we have a thing called the League of Champions. We met just a few hours ago uh, where we're helping capability build procurement leadership. We've also got a transformation panel, which is an advisory board of those that are tasked with embedding sustainability in procurement and capability in procurement. So there are a quasi advisory board that are helping us to build out this knowledge and content uh, and decide on things like legislation being a priority that we need to, to focus on. And then we have everything for everyone. So we have a chapter structure. So this is our big global meeting, which is for everyone in the world, regardless of where you are and what you're focused on. But we also have chapters for lots of different countries, SPP Singapore, Kenya, Denmark, it doesn't matter where you're from, there's always a, a meeting for you, probably increasingly uh, in person. You have industry chapters uh, where you can join your industry chapter and you have topic chapters like scope three, supplier diversity and so on. So the idea is of filtering your experience, you can join the right location, the right industry and the right topic, and you can filter all the noise and attend much more focused meetings and get much more focused content. So do check out at spp.earth, you can find your tribe, find your, find your groups, uh, and increasingly we'll get better at uh, letting you know when those meetings are, um, so you can join your local and industry and 
topic tribes uh, within that. And we're obviously run by an SPP steering team as a nonprofit, uh, which has been funded again by a number of CPOs already. Uh, and we're raising money from grant and foundations to accelerate our growth even further. So as I mentioned, if you go to spp.earth, you can find your tribe, find your, your groups, and get more and more uh, access to more and more information. So um, more importantly, let's introduce you to our still relatively new, uh, but feels like it's been around for a while, Executive Director, uh, Melissa. Are you there, Melissa? And if so, over to you to say hello. I am here. Thank you, Oliver. That was a great intro to everything that is SPP. I think you failed to mention that for the first three years, all of this was completely volunteer led and, and built. So that is a big piece of who we are and how we continue to work. Um, we really are for procurement by procurement. So I'm super happy to be seeing people from around the world chiming in and um, adding their comments to this meeting. I'm also sitting here today with Bertrand, who is uh, Bertrand Conquere, one of the two co-founders of uh, SPP, and with Catherine, who is one of the members of the growing team that's here to support you and the volunteers that have created SPP. So just a few, few quick updates, because I know we have a lot to go through in this meeting, and uh, we want to focus on, on the great speakers that we have today. Um, so Oliver mentioned that we did just meet with the League of Champions earlier today. They are a group that is um, working currently on a guide uh, sharing their best practices, their knowledge and their um, and their case studies. That is something to be watching out for as we're working towards having a platform where we're sharing information um, across the different stakeholders. We're having our first in-person meeting in September. Um, so lots of good uh, news and information coming between now and then. If you or your company are interested in learning more about the League of Champions, uh, how to participate in that, how to both, you know, continue um, making the most of SPP by being an ambassador and being part of these events that we have for you, for the community, but also being part of that group, that's something that we're happy to tell you more about. Um, we also have uh, supporters that help um, that that are donors to the organization. We are a not for profit that is completely funded by voluntary contributions. Fine Tune has just joined us in in that group. So thank you so much, Fine Tune. Um, we are working towards improving your SPP experience. So uh, Catherine and I are currently the team relatively new, uh, will be relatively new for a while longer, but we do have um, some new interns joining us over the summer. We have Alexandra, who I think is here on the call. There'll be um, also Louis joining us in July and one more in August. So very nice to have that team. But also you're going to start seeing um, our call to for you to join us as we continue to use LinkedIn, but also as we start to bring you into our processes to be able to respond to your interest by topic specific uh, areas. So, and for um, we know that for WSPD, the World Sustainable Procurement Day, every March, we were really uh, hearing back that you want to be hearing from your chapters, you want to be engaging on certain topics and with each other. So, we're working really hard to make that a uh, reality within the fall. Um, we are also happy to announce that we have been part of a successful EU grant application uh, for Buy Social Europe B2B. Uh, we're part of a consortium application for that that is working with, um, with B Corps to, to make that um, area of, of work more uh, accessible for companies. They're really interested in the way that we as a community, as procurement, have come together and have been able to collaborate um, to push sustainability as, as one of our, our mandates in an area of development. And finally, just just reiterate what Oliver has been saying. We are so pleased to be seeing how many people are coming together. Our goal is to be 1 million strong by 2030. That is an ambitious goal. We're taking over the world by coming together. Um, so definitely help us continue to grow that because the more we grow, the more we come together, the more we can hear what you want to be doing, the more we can be um, supporting you um, as procurement professionals. Um, join us on LinkedIn. We hope to be 20,000 strong by the end of this year and doubling every year. So that is really something that we have to push together. Lovely, lovely. And I see, as well as Catherine, I see on your right shoulder there, the co-founder of the SPP, Bertrand, uh, CPO of Henkel as well. Hello, Bertrand. Hope you're well. 
I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Uh, today, I think it's wonderful to have you, Oliver, and also Catherine and uh, and Melissa. And we are here together. Why? Because we we have so much ongoing that we have decided to meet uh, today and to, tonight, uh, working on strategy and next steps. And uh, this is the ongoing journey and the commitment to SPP. So a very good and a warm welcome to all of you. Back to you, Thank Oliver. You. Um, do you just want to pick up a couple of dates uh, coming up, um, Melissa? Yep, I just wanted to make sure that everybody is aware that there, there are these great quarterly meetings that we're having. We have World Sustainable Procurement Day, and we are announcing save that date. It is official. We're doing it again in March. Uh, but we also have regular um, events with our different chapters. So many of these chapters have their own LinkedIn pages where you can also engage with them. Go on our website. Um, and of course, they're happy to have you join those conversations and be part of those communities. So please do keep an eye on those upcoming events. Lovely, lovely. I'm loving and everybody anyone... saying hi. This is, there are people from everywhere here. And <laughs> That's what we love, isn't it? It's the most diverse audience imaginable. It's fantastic. So yeah, just a reminder for all those that are tuning in, very interested in the CSRD legislation, obviously, that's coming mm -hmm. in in EU. Uh, we will be covering that today, but there was also a wonderful whole session dedicated to it that ran last week with the SVP. So if you look in the chat, you can see the recording of YouTube there, um, and I highly recommend going doing that. was run by our Danish chapter. Uh, so well, thank you to the Danes for stepping up and, and, and tackling that for us uh, as well. So it's a, it's a real effort. But um, as we've said already, keep an eye out for World Stone Procurement Day, 21st of March, 2024. Um, it should be in your diary as already, I'm sure. So, um, Melissa, I know you wanted to give us a bit of an update on some of the uh, impact that we've been having as well before we get started on the rest. I'm actually going to pass the baton on to uh, Catherine, who's going to go through that with us today. Exactly. And this is really a peak um, peak view into a uh, preview into um, the full results that we will share in July. But I think it was a really good idea today, a good moment to show you actually and feedback to you the impact uh, the, the feedback that we received from you on how we are doing as SPP. So um, right after WSPD in March, we launched this um, sustainable procurement um, poll survey that we did um, the second time in collaboration with our partner Gartner. And um, a lot of you responded to that, really telling us on how we're doing. And if we look at the um, results, and as I said, it's really um, the first results, preliminary results with a focus here on the SPP impact on the community. It's really that we can see that um, there is a high level of satisfaction with the SPP resources that are accessible by joining this community, by joining this event like today and um, joining events and um, other resources that are shared by our chapters and other stakeholders. So we hear a, a, a good, a high level of um, satisfaction on this. We also see continue, continuously high levels of ambassadors who feel encouraged by SPP to take action and embed sustainable procurement principles in their professional practice. So that is actually how we want to attract ambassadors. This is part and the heart of our um, pledge. So we see also that this resonates and this is, um, it's, uh, yeah, that people, that you are taking action. And what we can also see here in one of the slides, um, uh, here on the slide, is that over 60% of you confirmed that SPP had a positive influence on their professional sourcing decisions. So even one step more, not only taking actions, but really seeing that um, um, the inspiration, the resources, the tools, um, the network that SPP provides um, has an influence on the decisions that you are making in your professional um, in your professional life. So. I will stop here. That was really um, a sneak preview. The full report, as I said, is coming in July with much more details and also in particular with the part on the state of sustainable procurement. Um, so look out for that. We will obviously share that in the community in, um, in July. Thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. And let's get on to the real content. Let's get on with helping those people, those 30 or odd percent who feel that we haven't yet helped them enough. So let's focus on you guys now uh, and actually make useful. So I think it was a resounding, uh, convincing story about what everyone wanted to talk about at this next global meeting, which was the land legislation landscape and the fantastic array uh, of things. So we are attempting a crash course today, and it is a crash course um, on, on the legislative landscape, both in North America, in Europe and, and beyond. So uh, 
I'm joined by a fantastic panel here today um, who are all going to be giving a bit of a download, a quick download of what they're experiencing and what their beliefs are and what their feelings are and what their evidence is around the legislation, particularly what it means for you as Bakuman. But there are as many people in this audience who are experts as, as them, they are. So we want your input as well. So if you feel like you've got something to share, if you feel like you've got a case study or a link or something to put into the chat, please do. The chat not only gets read, but it also gets digested down and we, we translate it into a digest to give everyone after the journey. So if anyone's got any questions, please put your hand up or post it into the chat. I'll try and track them and we'll do a bit of Q&A, obviously, as part of this session. But equally, do put your hand up if you've got something to share. And I know we've got a few experts that um, we couldn't even fit on the panel today that have got something to share. So we look forward uh, to hearing from you. So I'm joined today by Louise Herring of AIM Progress, a fantastic partner of the SVP, one of the best collaborations out there in sustainable supply chains, particularly focused on human rights and the consumer goods industry. And she's joined by Michael Littenberg of Ropes and Gray, um, who are providing and supporting them with a legal update, a legislation update every year, which is a beautiful update, a very, very thorough update, I must add, um, of absolutely everything. So we're delighted to have them. We've got Olivia Wyndham Stewart of the Responsible Contracting Project, who's going to be giving a bit of thoughts from them about how this fits, how the legislation fits into contracting as well as procurement. We have Cynthia Hannawalt uh, from the Sabin Center for Climate Change in Columbia, uh, the Columbia Law School, who's giving a bit of flavor of what's happening, particularly in North America, around climate change uh, regulation and disclosure. Uh, Chimdi from EcoAct and Eileen from Linklaters are also coming in to talk about CBAM. We promised we wouldn't mention acronyms, but the Carbon Adjustment Border Mechanisms, which I know a few of you have already been asking about. And Eileen's also going to be touching upon uh, CSRD and what it means for all of you as well. So hopefully you're all there. I'm going to assume you are. And uh, most importantly, perhaps first Louise and Michael, uh, hopefully you're there. Um, you can share a screen away if you like, and hopefully you can take, kick us off. Thank you very much, Oliver. I um, hope you can hear me OK. Um, there won't be any screens, certainly from my side. I'm not sure about Michael, but I'm just going to spend a minute introducing AIM Progress and introducing the legislative update that Oliver just spoke about. Then I'm going to hand over to Michael, who has a stonking seven minutes to run through responsible sourcing legislation. And then he'll hand back um, to me just to give you a sense of what does this mean for procurement people. First of all, just to say a massive thank you um, to everyone for inviting us along. It's fantastic to be part of this. I won't spend too long on that because of the time constraints. So as Oliver said, AIM Progress is a collaborative forum of fast moving consumer goods manufacturers and their suppliers. We work on human rights, we work on common issues and common supply chains, and our goal is to have a positive impact on people's lives and ensure respect for human rights. We cover, we have global brands across food and beverages, cosmetics, household products, healthcare. I think the thing I just wanted to say by way of introduction is um, the big change for us over the last 10 or so years has been a move from the voluntary to legislation and that has completely transformed the conversation in terms of human rights um, it's it's made it a requirement it's made it mandatory it's had a really big impact on all of the kind of corporates and that's why aim progress produces our twice yearly legislative report with our fantastic partners ropes and gray um, in that and i'll post the link in a second you can see and we've gone from i think 18 months ago 100 odd pages to 250 you can see the scale at which this is changing it's changing really rapidly companies need to understand understand the differences, also need to understand the overlaps and need to work out how to navigate those. We make that report public. It's an open source document that comes out twice a year. So I'm going to hand over to Michael. Um, Michael is going to talk you through what are the types of legislation, how are they changing and give you a sense of what that means for companies. Um, and then I'll come back and just spend a couple of minutes talking about what does that mean for procurement teams and what are some areas perhaps to focus on. So thank you again and over to you, Michael. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Louise. Also, thank you, Oliver. So seven minutes or less. Um, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, trends and developments that we're seeing in human rights focused uh, CSR, corporate social responsibility legislation. And, you know, we've just seen this, you know, dramatic increase in CSR legislation over the last few years, as Louise mentioned. Um, you know, I would say at this point, you know, we're probably at ropes and gray um, advising on and tracking more than 200 different adopted pending and proposed 
uh, CSR regulations around the world in about 20 different countries. And I would say that's probably a, a three to four times increase um, over what uh, we had just a couple of years ago. And the re regulations we see in this area, they really, they span a wide range of topics. Among other things, they include child and forced labor uh, and human rights more broadly, uh, as well as conflict minerals, climate change, deforestation, among other topics. And some of the regulations, you know, squarely relate to human rights while others intersect with human rights. Um, given the large number of instruments out there, I'm of course not gonna cover them all in detail today. My intent is rather instead to provide a conceptual framework for thinking about uh, CSR legislation. And I'll couple that with some examples and observations. And I think that will also then be a nice segue into some of the conversations later in the session today. Um, so for those of you that are uh, new to regulation in this area, I think the easiest way to understand the regulations is to group them into broad buckets based on what they require. And uh, CSR regulations tend to fit within three principal broad buckets. So first, there's disclosure only legislation and disclosure only legislation requires subject companies to describe the compliance measures um, and, and or risks, but it doesn't require them to take substantive um, steps to manage particular issues that are subject of that legislation. And the intent of disclosure only regulation is to create a race to the top through transparency. And the idea is that transparency in and of itself will drive substantive change, either due to companies' own organic efforts or through external pressures, whether that's from investors, NGOs, consumers, or other stakeholders. And uh, I think a good example of disclosure only legislation is the the modern slavery transparency statutes that we see in a number of different jurisdictions now. So in California, the UK, Australia, and most recently, just as of a couple of weeks ago, Canada with new requirements there starting in 2024. And the statutes in this area, they require companies to describe the steps that they've taken to address forced labor and human trafficking, but they don't require companies to take steps to reduce or address these issues. Um, climate risk disclosure legislation, which we'll get talked about later, uh, also falls within this category. Uh, the new EU Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which will be talked about later, also is in this category. And uh, the CSRD, as you'll hear about, it covers climate, but it's much broader, requiring disclosure on a lot of different topics, including uh, specifically various human rights related matters. Um, the second category of legislation also requires disclosure, but more importantly, it requires companies to take substantive efforts to mitigate risks and address adverse impacts uh, that come within the scope of the regulation. Um, and generally, this uh, the scope of this category of legislation includes fundamental human rights broadly, but also specifically, in some cases, child labor, conflict minerals, decent working conditions, and selected environmental impacts from hazardous substances. And as a shorthand, these types of instruments are often referred to as mandatory human rights due diligence legislation. Um, this category of legislation comes with more requirements than disclosure only legislation. So among other things, it generally requires companies to put in place management systems, conduct risk assessments, and also take steps to mitigate risks and adverse impacts. And instruments in this category include um, European mandatory human rights due diligence legislation that's already been adopted in Germany, Norway, and Switzerland uh, in the last one to two years. It also includes EU-wide uh, mandatory human rights due diligence legislation that's been proposed, um, namely the EU Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, or CS3. D or CSDDD, um, which may be adopted uh, as soon as later this year. And all of these instruments, they're conceptually similar in their approach since they're based on uh, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and also the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. Um, the third principal category of legislation is trade-based. And in a nutshell, trade-based legislation prohibits imports and in some cases exports of goods that don't meet specified uh, threshold conditions. As it relates to CSR, uh, most notably, trade-based legislation seeks to address forced labor. Um, the U.S. is currently leading in this area, Section 307 of the U.S. Tariff Act, uh, prohibits importing into the United States goods that are produced with forced labor. Um, additional legislation uh, also has been adopted in the United States in the last few years that creates a presumption uh, for purposes of 307 of the Tariff Act that North Korean labor and 
labor from the Xinjiang region of China is forced labor. Um, in addition, in the United States, uh, we're seeing customs and border protection um, enforcement of the forced labor import ban dramatically increasing, and um, we're seeing that continue to increase. Um, but the United States isn't the only country that's focused on imports produced with forced labor. Um, Canada and Mexico have also adopted forced labor bans, and legislation has also been proposed uh, in the EU, um, at the EU level, and also in Australia. Um, but uh, import-driven CSR legislation isn't only limited to forced labor. Um, the newest variant that we're now seeing is deforestation-related uh, legislation, which would limit imports of goods that contribute to deforestation. Um, and new trade-based legislation uh, relating to deforestation is in the process of being implemented uh, at the EU level and also in the UK. Um, so there's clearly a lot happening with CSR legislation, um, especially uh, as it relates to human rights. In the next couple of years, I think the compliance requirements will probably be two to three times what they are today. Um, so in closing, I think what I just want to do is leave you with a, a few parting thoughts on how to manage all of the new and increasing requirements in this area. Um, so first, um, I, I think where you can and consider where you can leverage existing compliance policies and procedures. Um, in many cases, I think you're going to find that you're able to do that. Um, CSR legislation uh, typically doesn't require you to stand up a compliance program from scratch. Um, second, uh, approach compliance in this area holistically. Um, a lot of CSR legislation is overlapping um, both in terms of subject and compliance requirements. Um, in addition, uh, managing CSR compliance holistically is more efficient and effective and also uh, better at reducing risk than a siloed approach. And then third and finally, um, consider a centralized approach to CSR compliance. I think with so many different requirements, uh, we're finding many companies are moving to a centralized approach to uh, CSR compliance since it's also more effective and efficient than a decentralized approach. Uh, and it also makes up uh, makes it easier to build up domain expertise in this um, fast moving area. So I've only scratched the surface, uh, but in the interest of time, I'm going to end my remarks here and I'll turn it back over to Louise uh, for some additional compliance recommendations. Thanks, thank you so much, Michael, and thank you again for being a great kind of ongoing partner in this area. Um, I, I'll, I just wanted to make some comments about how does this translate, translate, how does this legislation translate for procurement teams? And I will, I've just seen the comments about people wanting to keep up. So I, I'll, I'll pop these into the chat um, because we are covering it quite quickly. I think the things I was trying to think about, where does this legislation take us? How do you try and weave through all of that and work out what to focus on um, and five relatively quick points to make. One is about understanding risks. I think one of the key things is to understand where is risk in your business and in your supply chains and not to forget to look closer to home. There are forced labour and child labour risks in Europe and the US and those are risks that can't be removed even if the legislation is pushing for them to be removed. They need to be managed. So that was the first point. The second is around tendering and contracts. We're going to come to that later, but I think it's about thinking, how do you build in engagement and openness on human rights? Not compliance, engagement and openness on human rights. Compliance is important, but we need engagement and openness from the supply chain. Um, the third is around very simple things like a supplier code of conduct. Do you have one? Do you understand it? Can you work with your existing suppliers to make sure they're meeting the requirements as a very straightforward step? The fourth is around commercial terms, thinking about what you can do to support engagement on human rights. And really, I have to emphasize tackling human rights issues is about long term investment in supply chains and long term engagement. So whatever can be done in terms of commercial terms to support that. And then the fifth point is about responsible disengagement. It fits into what I said earlier about openness and trust. Um, but so much of what we're learning in this sphere is that walking away, cutting and running from human rights issues doesn't help the workers or the farmers impacted. It doesn't help your business. So um, I will pop all those comments into the chat so that people can see them um, and can respond to them. Thank you again, Oliver and everyone at the SPP for the opportunity to open this session. And I know we've got loads of other great speakers who are going to pick up on many of the things that Michael and I have already talked about. Thank you.
Thank you, Louise. Thanks, Michael. Uh, both stars. And as I said, the, the document that we shared the link in the chat is phenomenal. It is an absolute digest and snapshot of the world today. So thank you for that, Michael. A huge, fantastic piece of work. Um, and as I said, I think the key message that you shared there, Michael, that I got that is don't think of one legislation at a time. There's all this fits together. It's a way of changing your mindset as an organization, as a procurement team, thinking about things holistically. You can actually get a lot done by thinking about it as a whole rather than as individual uh, components. So um, some really, really good advice there. Thank you, guys. Uh, and I'm sure if anyone's got any questions for Louise or Michael, please put them in the chat. I'm sure Louise and Michael will happily answer them away in the chat and we'll no doubt come to some question and answers at the end. Um, so next up, Olivia. Are you there, Olivia? I'm here, Ollie. Hello. Thanks for having hello, me. Hello. 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 Can um, I uh, ask you to take over? You can indeed. Can I please ask you to allow me to share my screen? You should be allowed to. Can I? It says I've, it's been disabled. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there we go. From all my rogue screen sharing. Um, okay. okay, cool. So let me see if this works. Can, it, can you see if I we can. do that? Okay, cool. Yeah. I also want to say my colleague Patrick is in the Zoom room. And as I go, Patrick uh, might be sharing uh, some links. So just keep an eye out for links. I'm going to give you a quick intro to the Responsible Contracting Project. So, you know, we're trying to keep this brief and then later chatty. Um, so I might be quite succinct. We normally do these presentations in sort of 45 minutes, an hour. So apologies if it's a bit punchy, but I hope you get the main the main ideas. And I'll talk first about contracts and then about the project. And for myself, I'm Olivia Wyndham Stewart. I'm the deputy director and the co-founder of the Responsible Contracting Project. More broadly, I'm an independent business and human rights specialist. I've been working on um, human rights and supply chains for over a decade and for the last five years independently uh, for a range of uh, businesses, organizations, uh, governments, intergovernmental organizations and things like this. And under that, um, one of the things I focus on is contracts, because I think, and I hope you think, they're really important. Um, the reason contracts are so important, I don't need to explain to you, but just to kind of set the scene, is they are, of course, the primary mechanism that we have in supply chains for allocating risk and responsibility and reward between two parties. Now, that's obviously extremely important commercially, but it's also, in my experience, extremely important from a human rights perspective. So I have heard through my whole career, I've spent so much time in production countries, in production units, in factories, in fields, saying the contract doesn't allow me to do any of the things that are being asked of me. This isn't going to work. And so it's always been my perspective that much of what happens in your supply chain is really just a manifestation of what's written in your contract. So if you want to get your human rights right, you need to get your contracts right. And you can't have a kind of good supply chain and thriving human rights in your supply chain unless you have good contracts. So the problem really with this currently <laughs> um, is that contracts weren't really designed to maximize the flourishing of human rights. Uh, they were designed to manage company risk. So they were designed to minimize uh, the risk that your company might take on for human rights and to minimize the responsibility that you may have for human rights and to maximize commercial reward. That's how you would be an effective con contract negotiator if you're thinking about that from a commercial perspective. So that looks like in practice what we might all be very familiar with, uh, which is that we have these contracts which are a regime of representations and warranties where we know that suppliers and business partners have to simply say, I represent and warrant that the human rights in my supply chain are, of course, up to the standard that you require. They have all the obligations for upholding and maintaining uh, those human rights standards on the supplier. The, the buyer themselves is not actually engaging often in this process and certainly not through the contract. And they have traditional regimes uh, of contract damages between parties, which will often just be, of course, financial damages, not thinking about what the actual human rights damages uh, might be in some of these transactions. So these have proven, in my experience and in the experiences of many businesses and stakeholders, very ineffective for managing human rights risks and actually now increasingly ineffective for managing company risks. And that is because 
as we have said, uh, as we've heard from Ropes and Gray and also Louise, and also I do genuinely reference the Ropes and Gray report multiple times a day now, so thank you very much for that because it is extremely helpful. Um, the whole environment is now changing because human rights due diligence, like contracts, is also a framework for managing risk and responsibility. But whereas contracts have traditionally been a system to kind of shift that from one party to another, the OECD due diligence guidance and the UNGPs are saying, you actually have to share this. You have to share the responsibility. You have to share the risk between the parties. And we see this emphasis being made increasingly in legislation. So for example, in the German Supply Chain Act, we see an obligation on companies to establish responsible purchasing behavior. This is about the buyer taking responsibility for realizing their human rights outcomes, not just the supplier. We also see obligations to remediate and to exit as last resort. And these are principles that are key to human rights due diligence, but would not be key to traditional contracting. In the CS3D, in the EU legislation, we also see in the new text that contractual provisions need to be fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. They should reflect the joint tasks of parties to conduct due diligence in ongoing cooperation, and they should not be used to transfer the responsibility for carrying out human rights due diligence. And again, we have these sort of trade sanctions uh, that were being referred to earlier. These also require contractual frameworks to map and trace your supply chain and to really take responsibility for your human rights outcomes. So the point really is that traditional approaches to, uh, to contracting that shift risk, that use representations and warranties, that have supplier only obligations, that employ traditional mechanisms uh, for contract damages, don't account uh, for the things that we need to see in human rights due diligence, which is where the responsible contracting project comes in. Um, so the responsible contracting project, uh, which I am now representing in this session, is to give a brief history, a spin-off of an American Bar Association business law section working group. Now, the working group's uh, ambition was to draft model contract clauses that would better protect human rights and international supply chains, because the business lawyers in the business law section were becoming increasingly anxious that the way they were drafting contracts was actually leading to negative human rights outcomes. So it's it's very it was very interesting to me, I've been part of this working group since 2020, that this came from the business law section and they were looking for legally effective and operationally likely ways to uphold human rights in supply chains through their contracts. And the spin-off, the Responsible Contracting Project, which was launched last year, is a collective of lawyers from the working group, academics and business and human rights experts who collaborate to develop and disseminate practical tools to support more cooperative relationships and better human rights outcomes through their contracts. So at the heart of all this, and this is what I hope would be helpful for everyone on the call, is what we call the Responsible Contracting Toolkit. And those are 33 pan industry clauses um, that are really designed to align entirely with the UNGPs and OECD guidance so that your contracts begin to cohere with your commitments well, with not only your commitments to uh, human rights due diligence, but also to the legislative requirements that are coming from human rights due diligence. And I'll walk you through some of the key shifts between those traditional, uh, between traditional contracts and the RCP clauses right now, and then we can kind of tie off and we can chat about it a bit more. So as I said, in conventional contracts, we have these three sort of key approaches, which are the static supplier only representations and warranties, the, uh, the placing of the responsibility to realize human rights standards only onto the supplier and the traditional contract remedies. Now in the responsible contracting toolkit, we have a joint obligation to carry out ongoing risk-based human rights and environmental due diligence, which is shared between the parties. And we also have um, a whole section with responsibilities that the buyer must take for realizing uh, the human rights outcomes in their supply chain. So that includes a broad commitment to responsible purchasing, but also more detailed commitments um, such as responsible pricing, reasonable assistance, uh, responsible change orders and modifications and responsible exit. And many of those provisions that we're familiar with from human rights due diligence from the UNGPs and the OECD guidance. And we also place um, human rights remediation before or in conjunction with traditional contract remedies. So if there is an adverse impact after you've taken steps to identify, prevent and mitigate, 
um, the contracting parties have actually committed to putting human rights remediation first before engaging in discussion about a breach of contract as it relates to human rights. So those are some of the key shifts. Um, we work very broadly with stakeholders across the supply chain. We work with policymakers, we work with businesses, investors, MSIs, uh, governments uh, to really socialize and mainstream uh, these concepts for contracting, because we do think that in the legislative environment, there needs to be a very significant shift. Finally, it's also complemented um, by quite an extensive buyer code, which runs through from institutional commitments to responsible purchasing, supplier selection, contract negotiation, right through to human rights remediation and responsible exit. And those are commitments that we encourage um, companies to, to draft and take on around their contracts, because of course your contracts might be negotiated on a bilateral basis, but this is more about the commitment from the company. And all of these materials um, are modular, they can be drafted and adapted to suit your company. They're, they're cross-sector, uh, but we have also developed more specific sectoral clauses, for example, for the apparel sector. And through our work engaging in different sectors, we're refining uh, many of these clauses, electronics, et cetera, uh, so that they're much more uh, specific to the actual uh, sector and business. And I have a huge list of more resources. That is a small selection. But if you go onto the Responsible Contracting website, on the events and media page, you will see hundreds of academic articles, podcasts, uh, links that you can find, uh, media articles and everything else. So please have a look. And that's it from me. So thank you very much. And I'll look forward to the discussion. Awesome. Thank you, Olivia. Um, that re was really interesting. Um, so, And huge thanks, Patrick, for being so good in the chat. So for those that may feel like they're struggling to keep up and are utterly bewildered, uh, and don't worry, I feel a bit like that already, uh, the, the chat will be digested, will be organised, will be sent around to every slides will be shared. This e-meeting is being recorded, so we'll have a chance to digest it a little bit better uh, more later. But Equally, you can also put your hand up and put your question in the chat because we are going to be coming to you. A little question before we go on to the other speakers and point to make is if you are working in procurement and you have managed to organise yourselves and, and get ahead of some of this legislation or get prepared for it or be more agile or use it for it to actually drive a bit of change in your organisation in the way that you, you deal with this, put your hand up. We want to be hearing from you later on uh, as well. Olivia, thank you hugely for your, for your input there. Pleasure. So you... You might have felt that we've been touching on human rights a little bit, which is quite right, uh, but we're now going to be sort of diving a little bit into climate change as well. Um, so don't worry, we will get to that. Uh, thanks, Emma. As always, I will definitely come to you. You're very kind. Um, so, Cynthia, are you there? Can you uh, can you hear us? There you go. Excellent. And hopefully we can hear you. Great. Yes, I hope so. That's good. Yeah, excellent. Um, we can. We can. So, Cynthia, huge thanks for joining us. Um, I stumbled across a brilliant blog of yours. That was your fault, I'm afraid. Uh, that's why you've been invited <laughs> to this uh, this thing. And it covered a fantastic uh, overview of what's happening in particularly North America at the time. But but I know your thoughts are a little bit wider than that. So thank you for joining us. Uh, yeah, just share what your thoughts are and what this what you think this audience needs to hear. Sure. Thanks, Honor. Um, it's nice to talk with you all. I've actually gotten quite curious about procurement since um, the U.S. government last year, their procurement team issued a, a climate risk rule for federal contractors. So I'm delighted to be among you and learning more about this work. Um, I am with the Sabin Center, which is a think, a think tank in New York focused on climate change law. My project is specific to financial regulation. So I thought I'd comment on, on two regulations pending in the U.S. that I, I hope are relevant to, to many in this group. There is the SEC's climate disclosure rule, um, our securities regulator in the US, and then the government contractors climate rule I mentioned. Um, many of you probably know the Securities and Exchange Commission proposed a rule last year that will require public companies who are registered in the US to disclose certain climate related information, their exposure to physical climate related risks, their plans for transitioning to net zero. Um, they'll also have to disclose their scope one and two uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and in certain circumstances, the, their emissions from their supply chain as well, the scope three emissions. That requirement, scope three, was heavily criticized during the public comment period uh, for the proposed rule. And the chairman of the SEC, Gary Gensler, has said that he is inclined to limit it when, when the final rule comes out. Um, I think it's good to know uh, already the SEC's scope three proposal was not universal. Companies um, 
would only have to be uh, would only have to be disclosing their scope three emissions if they have a goal that covers scope three emissions or if their scope three emissions are material, which it does have a specific legal definition, but it basically means it's something that investors would rely on in their decision making. So you can imagine variations where the scope three requirement is limited even further, or perhaps it drops altogether. It, it's hard to know what the final rule is going to look like. The, uh, the commission has delayed the release three times now, actually. They're clearly struggling to find a compromise. They need three votes out of five. Um, it's currently slated to be released in October of this year. Um, and I think the other thing to know is you're planning um, whatever version of the final rule we do see, it is um, most certainly going to be challenged um, in litigation. There are likely to be multiple cases filed in different courts. Um, so there'll be real complexity to, to how those cases proceed. And I think, you know, obviously they'll go on for a few years. So firms will have to make compliance decisions in the meantime. Um, I think the reality is that the longer we wait for finality from the SEC, the more likely we are to see default disclosure requirements in North America actually following other regimes, um, either the CSRD requirements coming out of the EU that I know we're going to talk more about, um, or actually there are disclosure bills currently being debated in the state of California, um, which actually go a bit further than the SEC proposal in some respects, and, and California is the largest national economy in the US, um, so many large companies there will end up having to comply. So I think it's worth figuring out which of those regimes may apply to your business as well. Um, the other pending rule I just wanted to flag for you all um, before I stop is, is the US Federal Acquisition Regulation Council, the FAR. Um, they coordinate procurement for the US military, for NASA and general government services. Um, their proposal came out last November. It also hasn't been finalized yet. Um, and it requires businesses with over seven and a half million dollars in contracts to disclose their scope one and two emissions and contractors with over 50 million dollars in business with the government to disclose their scope one two and three emissions um, plus they'll have to complete various climate disclosures and then this is the big one they um, contractors will actually have to set science-based targets for reducing emissions um, this rule again it probably won't be finalized until the end of the year it's certain to be challenged in court as well um, but it is important because it goes farther than the SEC in several respects. It applies to private companies, not just public issuers, um, assuming they do business with the government, obviously. Um, the scope three requirement isn't limited by the materiality test. And then, of course, there is this requirement for actual emissions reductions plans. Um, so I think arguably it has, it has more impact on the market even than the SEC rule. So um, maybe I'll just leave it there for now and turn it back to you, Oliver. And Cynthia, thank you very much. Um, and if you would like to, again, I've got any questions about Cynthia and some of the stuff that's happening in North America, we'll obviously come to Q&A uh, later on, but feel free to put some questions into the chat and keep your eye on those, Cynthia, as well. But um, whenever scope three reporting uh, looks like it's going to have to become uh, something you've got to do, uh, that's when everyone starts to prick their ears up, because that is not easy. It is virtually impossible at the moment uh, and will be for some time, but you've got to get on and do it uh, regardless, because uh, it is going to be a, a good thing to do for a number of reasons, and it already is. So um, we'll hear more about that uh, in a minute. So thank you, Cynthia. Excellent. Um, so next up, uh, we've got Chimdi. Hopefully you're there, Chimdi. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Let me Wonderful. just put you into the uh, spotlight. And right. uh, there we go. Delighted to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, thanks for answering my call about CBAM, <laughs> which I had no idea what it was. I thought it was a fish at first, but uh, then I read into it and realised it isn't very much. So, uh, so thanks very much for uh, for picking the uh, the baton up and talking about the carbon adjustment border mechanism, which I'm no problem a bit more about. And over to you. Thank you. Cool. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me, Oliver. Hello, everyone. Um, oh, my quinn's been stuck there. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, my name is Chim Diobienu. I am a research consultant at EcoAct based in London. Uh, EcoAct is a climate consultancy and project developer with more than 17 years of global experience. Uh, I support firms with their climate related calculations, reporting and strategies with a particular focus on carbon pricing, but also work with scope three, as just mentioned. Um, and today I will talk to you about the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism, um, kind of what it is, how it will work and some implications for the procurement community. Oh, oh, I don't know why that's gone up there. Um, I won't go into too much technical detail as some of the specifics are still being finalized by the Commission, um, the European Commission, um, but I'm happy to answer whatever I can for now. Um, okay, so 
Uh, carbon border adjustments like CBAM are designed to ensure that firms in countries with carbon prices are not disadvantaged uh, by having to pay for, oh my, I don't know why my, uh, sorry, my slides keep popping over. Um, That's all right. Uh, um, are not disadvantaged by having to pay for their emissions uh, when their foreign competitors do not. So, for example, aluminium producers in Europe, for example, um, don't want to lose market share to companies that can produce more cheaply in, say, China, in part because those firms don't need to pay a carbon price in their own country. Uh, and so what CBAM will do is put a price on the emissions embedded in the production of certain goods imported into the EU. And so this will make sure both EU and foreign producers face the same production costs, at least with respect to carbon. Now, imports from countries with their own carbon prices will face lower CBAM costs than imports from countries without carbon prices. And so the EU hopes this will incentivize more countries to establish their own carbon prices to avoid additional costs being placed on their exporting firms when they want to export to the EU. Uh, and so already the, e the UK is considering its own CBAM um, and similar mechanisms um, regarding import duties have kind of gathered a bit of attention in the US. And so that's just to say that you know, CBAM will be the first, but it won't be the last policy of its kind in the coming years. Cool. And so in terms of the CBAM timeline, um, before 2026, in what is currently being called the transitional phase, uh, regulated firms will face reporting obligations only. Uh, and so by reporting obligations, I mean, you know, mainly calculating the emissions um, associated with their goods and then reporting them to the European Commission. However, for goods imported in 2026 and beyond, regulated firms will also need to buy a number of CBAM certificates corresponding to their emission levels. And so I'll go into a bit more detail on that shortly. Um, for this transitional phase, uh, cement, iron and steel, aluminium, fertilizers, hydrogen, and electricity are covered by CBAM, so imports of these goods. And the specific products uh, within these kind of categories are combined by, are classified by their combined nomenclature codes, which is the classification system used for most goods when they're declared to customs in the EU. Um, but the EU is actually considering expanding the scope of CBAM by 2030. So this kind of list of goods, um, these categories uh, is by no means final. Okay, so in terms of initial reporting obligations. So again, during this transitional phase, importing firms will first need to register to be able to import the covered goods. And then one month after the end of each quarter, um, a report will be due to the commission in which the importers detail you know, the quantity of each type of good imported, the embedded emissions of each good, uh, the effective carbon price for the production of that good paid in the country of origin, and then a lot of additional information, uh, including details about the production facility. Um, and so with CBAM beginning in October of this year, um, so Q4, the first report will be due in January of 2024. Uh, I kind of mentioned specifics earlier. So when it comes to actually calculating these emissions, uh, the EU is still finalizing some of its methodologies for doing so. Uh, and this will differ based on the product, it will differ based on the location of origin, and also the data availability of the given producer. Uh, and then the EU is also finalizing the exact reporting formats for these quarterly reports. So after a few years, when this transition phase is completed, we'll move into the full phase. Um, and in the full phase, the main difference is that firms will also need to purchase and then submit electronic CBAM certificates. Uh, the price of these certificates will be pegged to the price of credits under the, under the EU emissions trading scheme. And the number of, cred of, of certificates that each firm needs to buy will depend on the kind of reported information listed in this slide and that I mentioned in the last slide. Um, so, so for example, um, the number of certificates an importer needs to buy will be adjusted downwards if the producer faced a carbon price in their own country. Uh, and this number will also be adjusted downwards based on the level of any rebates offered to EU producers of that good that are regulated under the EU emissions trading scheme. Uh, a lot of other details in here, um, time, time not permitting, unfortunately, but happy to answer any more questions on that um, soonish. Um, a few key points about CBAM. So importers will be able to buy these certificates throughout the year. Um, throughout the year, you don't just have to you know, buy them at the start or the end of the year. Um, CBAM doesn't impose any import limits on companies, it's just costs. Um, importers cannot trade these certificates, they're not the same as carbon credits. Um, importers cannot buy these certificates and then hold them for several years to kind of try to play pricing games. 
And you also can't just wait until the end of the year to buy all of your certificates. You do need to buy a certain percentage throughout the year. Um, but again, this phase is still a couple of years away. The EU does have a few more pieces of uh, a, a few more pieces of implementing legislation to kind of finalize these details. Um, so, in terms of key implications, I understand that you know most of the audience won't be directly subject to CBAM. Um, for those who are, you know, EcoAct, and I'm sure many other firms would be happy to walk you through this, the, spe the specifics and your obligations. Um, for anyone else, um, a key thing to mention is that directly regulated firms will look to pass these costs through to their consumers, uh, just the same way as they do with carbon prices, carbon taxes. Um, and so to manage your exposure to border car carbon adjustments, it's important to have visibility in across your supply chain in terms of you know, what your embedded emissions are, the border carbon adjustments that your suppliers may be subject to, and also whether these suppliers or their potential alternatives have decarbonization plans in place. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the EU hopes that CBAM will prompt more countries to establish or raise their own carbon prices. And so this should also prompt firms to assess their direct or indirect exposure to carbon prices, as well as any border carbon adjustments that may be set up in those countries down the line. And so, for example, most firms in the UK should at least be assessing their potential exposure to a UK CBAM, probably starting now. And then final slide from me. Now, again, whether you're working with EcoAct or another consultancy or keeping these, this kind of work in-house, uh, we recommend a few things. Uh, and so the first is to engage with your suppliers. And so that means finding out you know, what their current and projected emissions are, and then formalizing processes that incorporate this kind of information into your procurement decisions. Um, the next is to calculate and report your direct and indirect emissions. And especially if you're dealing with complex products, this can require in-depth life, life cycle assessment services and familiarity with approved methodologies. And then finally, um, you'll want to quantify your potential financial risk. Uh, so for example, at EcoAct, we have a carbon and energy pricing tool uh, that takes the location and scale of your emissions, considers carbon pricing mechanisms across the world, and then our model estimates how your carbon costs will evolve you know, by location, by product, by facility in different climate scenarios. Um, but however you go, um, this kind of analysis is certainly needed to manage risk as we enter a world of more stringent climate action. Um, so that is all from me today, and I will upload a few resources on carbon pricing, um, on CBAM, on a few other EU policies like CSRD um, into the chat uh, right now. Um, awesome. So, yeah. Thanks, Jimmy. That's excellent. And uh, you've generated quite a conversation. Uh, as I said, <laughs> professionals have taken one look at CBAM and thought, hello, uh, this looks interesting uh, for a number of reasons. And again, everyone who's looking at Scope 3, obviously, this makes Scope 3 uh, even more uh, interesting, complex, confusing, uh, dangerous, exciting, whatever word you want to choose uh, than, than the normal. So that's not a surprise. Um, uh, we have got some other speakers, but I do want to, Verena is there. I don't know if you know Verena. You've got a, a really good question there. I don't know if you're willing to ask that question and be bold enough rather than just have me read it out. Yeah, super in time, actually, because we just had a conversation internally about CBAM and what we will do to it or about it or how we will respond. Obviously, uh, having primary data from suppliers is not going to happen anytime soon at scale. So we were wondering um, if maybe we can simply use data that we have in-house because obviously many companies who have set uh, greenhouse gas emission targets have also done an inventory and they've used emission factors either on spend-based or weight-based to estimate what their upstream emissions are. They're usually reported under a greenhouse gas protocol scope 3.1 purchase goods and services so it would be quite simple for us to just pull those materials under the regulation and use the emissions that we've calculated with the emission factors that we have an auto atomized tool do you think that's allowed or will the eu come up and say no no you have to have a separate calculation with different emission factors that are provided by the eu any any comments yeah, so what I what I can say uh, to that currently is that, again, the EU is still finalizing this legislation. Um, but what they have said, at least for the first year or so of the reporting period, is that some firms, I think, in your position may be able to use methodologies that are already allowed under existing under existing uh, carbon pricing or reporting um, or reporting policies. And so 
that that exact list is yet to come out that, that, that those exact definitions but it's possible that you may be okay but further down the line they are very much specifying their own methodologies and it's likely that you won't be able to use what you've maybe been using so far so it will be either your own calculations based on supply data uh, or i know that some suppliers will so you know pr production facilities will be able to sign up to the eu's cbam registry and do their calculations there and then you'll be able to use the data that they upload there um, but right now it's a wait and see for the first year or so you may be able to use some of the methodologies that you've been using already great thanks excellent uh jamie yeah, sure. Um, a question for Tim D or for the prior speakers. Um, I'm at Supply Shift. We've been helping companies for a long time assess and address all kinds of sustainability issues in their supply chains and, and get real data. And these laws are a huge push for companies to do more. Um, they all, not all, but most seem to have an extended implementation time, which um, is requiring companies to think about what to do. But sometimes, um, just like the last comment said, you know, how can we do something that fills the gap for now? Um, yet that puts companies in a position where they might be behind the game when it comes time to, to really address the problem. Um, we've heard some really good arguments for why engage suppliers now, um, but companies still hesitate. So I'm wondering what the speakers think about, um, you know, why act now when law X doesn't really kick in for another year, another two years? Um, can you get by by just what data do I have now? Or when is the right time to start a real program to engage and understand your supply chain? Our perspective is now, but <laughs> I'm wondering what others think. Yeah, it's a great question. I think also, particularly when you hear the story in North America where everything's gonna go through uh, legislators uh, and uh, and lawyers and everything else, it, it feels like um, uh, it's an inevitability, but there's also lots of excuses not to necessarily do something straight away. Um, so question for any of the speakers, who wants to perhaps pick that question up? And I'll spotlight you, whoever wants to do that. Uh, I can go ahead quickly. Yeah, um, go for it, Jimmy. Sure. I think that, and this may, may be a bit cliched, and may, may, but um, an aspect that has come up when I've been working with scope when scope three calculations, for example, in terms of why start early or why do it now, it just it does take time to get it right with suppliers. And so you can if you say you start now um, trying to get direct supply data from a direct data from a supplier in terms of their emissions, it's probably not going to be perfect the first year around. And so giving yourself that kind of leeway to be able to to get it right in a few years when this legislation does come into place. It, it will be a cost benefit analysis that you'll have to do on your own, but that is where that's where I would say the value is. Um, that's where I'd say the value is. So, yeah. Okay. Louise? Um, yeah, I think just to give the human rights perspective, um, you know, the same kind of perspective. If you look at some of the legislation, we didn't talk about the European sustainability reporting standards, which is a whole another set of issues, but that's going to come into force in 2025 which is gonna ask companies to be reporting on social impact of a certain size. And I, yeah, I don't see how you can do any of that if you're not starting to engage with the supply chain and starting to build their human rights capability. And the other point just to make is we've been tracking, you know, members capability in this space for the last 12 years, and we have seen progress, but it is very slow and it is very gradual. So if you're not starting to move on it now, I, I don't think you have any chance of being where you need to be by 2030, basically. Right. Uh, if I may add to your question as well, Jamie, uh, there is a bifurcation that's happening on both sides of the Atlantic. A lot of the legislation, as you can see, there's a heavy shift coming from the European Union. A lot of it is very, very heavy in uh, jurisdictions that have been very successful and very established in ESG reporting and requirements for several decades now. There's large data sets that already exist. The very real and material risk that exists in North America, which is why you're seeing such an active legislative landscape and also case landscape, these pieces of laws are being sued, is that it has happened in isolation. The assumptions that underlie the European Union economic structures are not ones that are true in North America, but lift and shift is taking place. And so companies in North America cannot conceivably look at Europe and say, yes, this is a great plan, let's do exactly that, because they were not built for North America. They were not built for the economic assumptions that are true in North America. And in some cases, it's not that the companies are reticent, it's that the thing that they're being forced to waive that does not fit them. You cannot, for instance, say that human rights protections that are possible in the European Union, because a lot of offshoring has already taken place, 
should take place in the same way in North America because the laws that enable them in the two places are not the same. The employment protections are not the same. And so to assume that they will move in the same direction and to assume that the companies will move in the same direction in both places, I think is short-sighted because it is not a left and shift. We might all be on the same planet, but we are not subject to the same truths. And so data collection and movement and reporting here, it's very short-sighted to assume that we can do both things at the same time. Um, I was taking notes while Chimney was speaking, for instance, and the carbon trading, there aren't com commonalities between the carbon trading in North America and in Europe, but both of them will be subject to our supply chains. We're breaking things, assuming they'll be the same, but they are not. And so your companies, to your question, will face this material risk because inherently they're saying, why am I being made to wear a hat for Europe when it was never measured for my head? Very good points. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Michael, you had your hand up as well. Sure. So I'll, Oliver, you know, on, on your question about well, why kind of start dealing with all this legislation now when, you know, you may have a couple of years to implement it. Um, you know, one thing we didn't really talk about at all today is just, you know, um, assurance requirements. And, you know, a lot of the kind of newer, you know, legislation that's coming out, you know, especially CSRD, you know, the climate legislation is going to require um, third party assurance. And it's going to take a lot of companies a lot of time you know, to build out those controls that they're need to, going to need to have in place to have that data assured. And then, you know, the other thing that we're just seeing, you know, with all of the mandatory human rights due diligence legislation, some of the more comprehensive legislation is, especially in big enterprises, it really takes a lot of time to kind of get your arms around, you know, everything that's required, you know, on a global scale. Um, you know, it's not a quick process. And we're finding many companies need a couple of years to do that. And so, you know, especially very large companies. So, um, you know, so you really need a lot of lead time here. And you, you can't wait until, you know, a couple of weeks before a piece of um, legislation takes effect to, you know, kind of start brushing up on it and feel, figuring out what it requires. Absolutely. And uh, a perfect time to bring uh, uh, Aileen in. Would you mind coming in and, and joining us? And perhaps you can pick up the CSRD uh, conversation as well. And we'll, we'll come back to this conversation after that. Uh, you're on mute, I think. Apologies. You'd have thought I'd have got over that by now. Thank you, Oliver. Right. And thank I'm, you I'm for, a king of it. Don't for having me. <laughs> Um, just one point, actually, before I go into CSRD, just to build on what others have said around um, getting ahead of the game and thinking about this earlier than you may feel you need to, um, is the point I would add to what others have already said is the need for expertise on this, both within organisations and also potentially needing to reach out to external expertise as well. And it does just take time to figure out what information you have and where you need additional help, whether that's internally or externally, and to get that in place, especially given lots of organizations and companies will be doing the same thing at the same time. So that's just another reason to add to the pile why, why it is good to think about this sooner rather than later. Yeah, absolutely. So that was big picture. Um, I am just here briefly to speak for five minutes as a kind of update and reminder on this CSRD. I'm conscious we have lots of acronyms in this space. That is the European Union's Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. I am a lawyer at Linklaters um, based in London, but we help companies globally with various ESG issues. So I'm going to remind you all of what the CSRE CSRD is, though many of you I imagine are sick of hearing about it, the current status, what this means for procurement teams, and to link back to what we were just talking about, what it is worth thinking about now. So as a reminder of what it is, it is a piece of regulation which places expanded obligations on companies to disclose fairly extensive ESG related information. Um, uh, it's coming in in a phase process at a very high level. It applies first to large listed EU companies, um, then works its way down through smaller and smaller companies. The requirement is to disclose ESG related information, both about a company's own business and about its value chain, which is obviously very, very relevant to those of you working in the procurement space. Um, and some, but not all of those disclosures are subject to a materiality qualifier. So you also need to figure out what information is material enough to require reporting. 
So the CSRD says that companies have to do that. The actual information on what information is to be disclosed sits in what are called European Sustainability Reporting Standards, which Louise mentioned earlier. They have their own delegated act under the EU, which is currently um, latest version came out for consultation a couple of weeks ago, and that consultation is open to July, but they will probably be in place later this summer. And what the standards look like at the minute is there's a set of 12 of them. They are sector agnostic, though later down the line, the EU is talking about developing sector specific standards and specific standards for small and medium sized enterprises. Two of those standards are cross cutting, so they apply across all topics. And then there are five on environment topics, four on social topics, and one on governance. And that is where the content of what information you as a company actually need to look at disclosing is all laid out. Current status, as I mentioned, the CSRD itself is in force, starts actually requiring companies to report from 2025 for financial year 2024. And the ESRSs, the standards that sit underneath that, will be finalized probably later this summer. What this means for procurement teams, it means that companies as a whole are still getting up to speed on what this means for the companies reporting and the systems that sit behind that. And for procurement teams, you may see that coming up in various ways. So you may be asked to help get information on your company's or your organization's value chain, meaning that you will need to be asking for information on various ESG elements from your suppliers in order to be able to help your organization or company collate um, and prepare your own ESG reporting. The flip side of that is you may well get requests from people in the supply chain who also have reporting obligations asking you for equivalent information. So there's a piece around figuring out where you retain all that information and ensure you respond to those requests in a consistent and comprehensive fashion. There's a piece around contracts. So if you want to reconsider any contract terms to make it easier for you to request or receive that information on a regular ongoing basis. Um, and thinking about what you do if that is not met. And then more broadly, depending on the information provided and how your organization chooses to approach this and their related goals and requirements in relation to ESG related issues, it might impact your requirements or processes for, for example, tendering and selection of suppliers. What is worth thinking about doing now? I think we've already touched on most, most of this already, but it is good to engage early if you can with this. In the first instance, if some of you may already be up to curve on this, but it's good to figure out where in your company or organization this is being managed out of and where the process has been dealt with so that you can make sure that you're involved in those conversations in a way that is helpful for both you and others in the company as early as possible. Um, rather than this being kind of imposed on you late down the line, making your own life harder in terms of implementing it. Um, and also just to make sure that they know what you are able to help them with. Michael already mentioned this in relation to human rights legislation, but it is also worth as part of that process, identifying what processes, contractual clauses, and standard terms, for example, you already have in place that you can leverage here, um, rather than necessarily needing to create an entire new framework and to identify any gaps that you may need to close going forward and then create a roadmap on how you're going to address those gaps. That was very, very short and high level for what is a very long and complex piece of um, legislation. I am going to just, I, I will repost the link that you posted earlier, Oliver, to the Danish chapter's longer session on CSRD, because it is really helpful. And I would recommend that you all look there if you have any further questions on the CSRD and how this applies in the procurement context. And equally happy to answer questions in the chat if anyone has any. You're a star. Thank you so much for, for, for joining us and uh, and for covering that. I know it was one of the more popular legislations that we wanted to cover. And then I realized that we were running a meeting on it previous week. That's the fun of growing an organization like we are. <laughs> There's always something going on. So there is plenty going on. So a huge thanks to you. Um, uh, I'm sure plenty of people, we've got a bit of time, so we're going to go into some questions. And I know, uh, Emma, if you're still there, I'd love your thoughts. And Alyssa, if you're there as well, we want to be hearing from those who are actually in procurement and, and looking at this. So both questions and thoughts from you. But um, 
in terms of people thinking, oh, there's some gold dust here in terms of what people have said and what's in the chat, don't worry. It is all being recorded. It's also going to all be digested. I don't know if everyone's seen the clever people that are using AI to actually uh, understand what's happening in this meeting as well. We might have a go at that very shortly soon in order to digest all of this. But uh, um, yes, it's going to be all there and we will put it on the website underneath the challenges of legislation. Um, so it's all relatively easy to find. So all of that is coming soon. Um, Emma, are you there? Would you mind just, um, I think you said you put your hand up and share some thoughts and maybe a question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Oliver. Hi, everyone. Um, it was actually a, a slightly controversial question to I'm Olivia. Emma. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. So so we we were actually, so first of all, I, I loved I loved that section. I've, I've taken lots of links and I shall be sending it all to our lawyers shortly. Um, which is very exciting. Um, but we quite recently sort of issued all our own sort of human rights statements and, and guidance documents. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, they, they got in the hands of our external legal team um, that then sort of called a, a sort of emergency meeting to, to communicate quite an interesting story to us, which I thought might, might be interesting for everyone on this, this call to hear. Um, it happened a few months ago, so I'm probably not going to sort of be as eloquent as I would have been two months ago when explaining this, so bear with me. But in short, there have been three very large companies um, that have um, been taken to court by litigation funds um, because they have shown duty of care with their subsidiaries. So the fact that they have um, been shown to be caring about training looking after their subsidiary companies has meant when, when the subsidiary company has been taken to court, um, they've been able to argue that the parent company should also be taken to the court in short. I'm not explaining this brilliantly, but what no, this I has created, um, according to this law company in the magic circle, is it's created a precedence whereby if companies are seen to be showing duty to care potentially to their suppliers, one day litigation funds may have good fun going after the end client because they have shown duty of care by actually um, taking responsibility for their suppliers processes behaviors and and ways of doing things now we went through this process and decided that doesn't matter we're still going to do our statements and we're still going to train our suppliers and do the right thing but i thought it was interesting um, that there are people in the world, investors, paying into litigation funds to go and identify companies to take them to court for doing the right thing. Um, and I just thought that's quite an interesting environment that we seem to be walking into. I do, uh, I, it's a great uh, topic of conversation. It's a very big question. There it absolutely has been established in case law uh, some circumstances in which a parent company has duty of care. Um, they weren't taken to court for doing the right thing. Um, I have to say, I mean, I think the judgments are pretty clear that it wasn't the right things that got them into court in the first place. That there's a there's a, there's a shift that needs to happen, which is, yeah, all companies are going to have basically a duty of care for their supply chain, and the way the due diligence legislation is going is that you will have to take responsibility for your supply chain. What is a less good idea? is operating that in that environment and doing things like signing away the rights and responsibilities in your contract so that you're not really doing your due diligence properly, because then, yes, the things that happen will see you in court. Um, you know, the companies that were taken to court did have the ability to conduct their due diligence and could put forward in the new legislative environment a defense of due diligence, which is that they conducted a risk assessment of their supply chain, they prioritized their risks, they did their best to mitigate and account for the risks that were arising. And then there can be a decision over whether or not they did that appropriately. But it's definitely, I, I, I definitely don't want because there is a response where companies can be like, ah, I better back out, you know, but it's not going to work anymore. You won't be able to back out of your supply chain completely. You need to kind of accept, and I can't believe I'm about to use this this term, but you have to kind of lean into your supply chain <laughs> um, and really take responsibility for it. Because if you do that, then the chances of going to court are going to be reduced because your human rights impact should have been manage better in the first place does that kind of make sense it's a bit of a like conceptual shift that companies need to go on which is like the more you take responsibility for the human rights outcomes of your supply chain the better it will be and the less chance you have of going to court yeah 
Oh, yeah, I completely agree, Olivia. I just thought it was funny that we were um, being advised by a series of lawyers to look at this as a potential risk. We yeah, I mean, lot, that's how law yeah. firms, you know, a lot of law firms, there's a transition happening, which is that's how a lot of law firms will work. There was another case in the Dutch courts recently about a manufacturer, uh, G-Star. I don't know if anybody saw that, but they had a framework agreement uh, to source a su significant quantity of goods over the um over the pandemic and they pulled back and the court found that because they had this code of conduct they had committed to the worker rights and the supply chain that they were liable for the for the impact on the workers now the judgment hasn't actually been passed so we can't see what it means in terms of remediation but yet increasingly it is going to be the world in which we operate is one where you really will be taking responsibility kind of whether you like it or not for where you're sourcing so you know le lean into it and, and make sure you get way ahead of the potential impacts yeah. you can definitely see why people would be scared though emma can't you who haven't got that understanding appreciated that so I would be, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know I mean, it's reasonable but uh <laughs> yeah it's a really good point because things are definitely changing Lovely. We've got eight minutes left, guys. So if anyone's got any pearls or of wisdom or, or thoughts, then please do add them in. KG, I think I'll call you KG. Uh, it sounds like you've got something to say. <laughs> uh, my name is Joanna Ridishma, by the way. It's nice to meet you and it's nice to see you, Ken Olivia. Yeah, um, my question is more to the panelists. So there's been a lot of offshoring from the European Union to other countries of their carbon emissions. Uh, there are some loopholes in the legislation that has existed within the current framework. With scope three emissions and the calculations of those, it should have the effect of bringing those back on shore for lack of a better term. And it ideally uh, would create total cost of ownership calculation for carbon emission savings. My example would be the Netherlands where, and Ireland actually, where they're proposing to slaughter a bunch of cattle, um, not accounting for the fact that supply of that food will still have to take place. And the carbon cost of bringing that from another jurisdiction is going to be higher than producing it locally while they will show local savings. Where do you anticipate the European Union going to reckoning with its own past, past bad habits in shoring up some of these gaps? Okay, lovely. Uh, Chimdi, maybe one for you. I'm sort of handing it to you tentatively. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I want to take that one on. To be honest, that's that's, 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 that's a tough one. In kind Sorry. of yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if anyone wants to catch that grenade for me. I'll be honest. Yeah, um, no problem. Hmm. Anyone else got I, any thoughts on that? Because there is a lot of uh, legal action taking place. Uh, Olivia and I believe the previous speaker had spoken to that as well. And we know there's liability gaps that are going to start being recognised. We are seeing expanded director liability, etc. And I'm trying to figure out how to translate that into actionable pieces in our agreements, in our corporate structures. How do we address these risks proactively and mitigate them, knowing that it's likely going to come because our past habits will, they will catch up with us. Good point. Cool. Okay. Um, if anyone's got any thoughts, they can put their hand up. That's absolutely fine. We've still got a few more minutes left, but um, I, I will attempt to uh, give a bit of a, a very layman summary of some of the stuff that I heard, which is uh, it's very confusing. There's lots going on. <laughs> and uh, the realities are the same obvious things apply. Talk to your suppliers. Think about things holistically. Get on with it already. Collect the data. None of those things you won't regret any of those things, uh, engaging suppliers, collecting data, sitting back and looking at the whole picture, getting expert help. All of those things are going to be no regret actions. I think it's safe to say so. Uh, look how clever I am making all those obvious statements. Uh, but I think that's certainly a pattern I've seen. Um, has anybody else got any final thoughts before we finish and particularly um, on what it means for procurement professionals, perhaps, uh, and, and their uses? Maybe Maybe a quick final thought from from a couple of the speakers. Maybe Louise, if I if I dare come to you to add a quick reflection to finish the meeting, uh, and maybe a couple of other speakers as well. Maybe Olivia, you you next after that. Thanks, Oliver. Um, I think <laughs> I mean I've come away. It's been very insightful for me in terms of getting the environmental piece, which um, is what I I don't do day to day. I look at the human rights legislation, which, as Michael summarised, is a complex enough picture. So it's it's more of a you know a thank you for helping me understand 
the other side of the equation, I think we've had some questions about the need to bring those two together and look at things like solar panels and forced labour and what is the legislation driving in those senses? Is it driving the right behaviour? So, um, yeah, I think that's my kind of overarching thought to come away with is it's sympathy for those that are trying to tackle both sides of the, the kind of legislation and navigate through. But I think many of the, the points that you've made, Oliver, are right in terms of the direction to move in. Exactly. And it is definitely something that's obviously true. You know, environmental and social are interwoven now more than ever before. And uh, unfortunately, procurement professionals have just about got their head around one and just got about their head around the other. And now we're telling them that you know, they're interwoven is a, is a big challenge. But I think that's an obvious one, definitely. And I think a, a very important one. I know there's been lots of talk about how, for instance, German Supply Chain Act, you can use that as a method to actually start talking about environment with your suppliers. Not people necessarily haven't realised that um, or thought about that. Um, Olivia, would I mind just asking you? for your just final reflections from what you've heard oh, absolutely um thanks for having me everyone um you know i just kind of think procurement rules the world um so i really do encourage you all to sort of exercise your power and exercise your leverage um it does seem complicated but there is also a cohering framework which is essentially just human rights due diligence so if you build your framework and if you map out how to identify, prevent, mitigate, account for and remediate your risks, and you prioritize and you, I really like Ollie's idea of sort of no regret actions. You're not going to regret engaging with your suppliers. You're not going to regret engaging with your stakeholders. You might not like it immediately because <laughs> uh, you might hear some things that you wish you didn't know, but that's only going to help you in the long run. So go out and find all the things in your supply chain that you kind of wish you might not have to deal with and you'll be getting like way ahead of the action so i think it's a really exciting time um and i think yeah it will be great to have this group in this community kind of help everyone through the new transition but i hope it will simplify like as everything coheres and as everything falls into place so those are my thoughts Lovely. Thank you. A uh, huge thanks to all of you. Uh, I can't remember exactly who spoke. It was loads of you. It has been a crash course. But Olivia, the procurement does rule the world. But I have to show this slide as well. As Thomas Susan, one of our co-founders, says, uh, he, he likes to think he's Spider-Man, I think. I wonder if he dresses up at the weekend. But um, he, as he says, with great responsibility comes you know, great power. Well, great, with great power becomes great responsibility. So this is something that we all need to remember as procurement. We we are now getting the respect. We're now getting the reputation we deserve. We're now getting the skills and the talent re recognised. But with all of that comes great responsibility. So a huge thanks to all of you. I think this has been a really good session. Uh, we've gathered lots. There's going to be lots more to come. Um, keep tuned in for the next session, which will be in September time and uh, yeah but a huge thanks to everyone that's taken part and for all of your involvement and um, a very busy chat to digest uh, which I think says it all. Thank you everyone I'll see you again soon. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Welcome. Bye. Thanks and bye everyone. I'll have to take the hoodie off now. It's far too hot to be wearing this hoodie. <laughs> as much as I love the merch. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, we'll see you all again soon. <laughs>